Hello, welcome to the 2021 Ohio Anna Book Festival. My name is Ben Sapp, director of the Maz Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, the writing and illustrating of children's book panel. Uh, we'd like to thank our festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed on the Ohio Anna website. And thanks to our official bookseller, the Book Loft of German Village. You can get copies of all the books featured at the festival by going online to bookloft.com. And now I'm pleased to welcome our authors and illustrators. Uh, we have Tim Bowers with us today, Terry Liebenson, Christina Wald, and Lindsay Ward, um, all friends of the Maz Museum and uh, friends of all of us that have a real true love and appreciation of the art from picture books. And we just thank you for being a part of this uh, panel discussion today. Um, I would like for this to be as uh, really truly um, uh, almost a, a conversation between each other and uh, between the audience and, and yourselves. Um, each of you have a book that we're, we're highlighting today. And if we could um, go around and, and you just share a little bit about yourself with our audience and then to introduce and highlight the book that you have uh, with us today um, that will be uh, recognized here at the festival. Tim, could we start with you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my book is Memoirs of a Tortoise. It was written by Devin Skillion, published by Sleeping Bear Press. And it's the fifth memoir book that Devin and I have worked on together. And it's a story about uh, Oliver the tortoise and his pet human. Um, and they're both 80 years old. And so it's, a, it's kind of a touching story. There's some humor in it, like the previous um, books that we've worked on together. But this touch goes a little bit deeper and maybe I'll get into that uh, in a little while. But it's, it's a story about Oliver the tortoise and Ike, his 80 year old, um, owner or pet, as he, he calls him. And um, it's about um, loss, losing someone, but also appreciating uh, what you have and, and the people in your life. Things like that. So it's. Thank you. Sure. Terry, Terry would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my book is called Becoming Brianna, and it is the fourth book in um, my middle grade series, which is called Emmy and Friends. Um, <clears throat> this book is a little bit different than most of my other ones. It's um, most of my books are told from the viewpoint of two different characters and the, and the chapters switch back and forth. Uh, this one is just told from the standpoint of one girl, Brianna, that's her. <laughs> and, uh, and the chapters switch off back and forth between, um, I wanna say present day Brianna and past Brianna. And all the chapters that take place in the present day are on the day of Brianna's bat mitzvah. And all the past chapters are um, the months leading up to that moment. And even though it's a story about a bat mitzvah, it's, it's for anybody. And it has all the humor and all the drama and everything you'd expect from the series. And that's uh, one of one of my favorite books that I've written, and I hope everybody likes it as well. Thank you. Christina, could you share with us a little bit about uh, A Wish for Pangolin? Yeah, my book is A Wish for Pangolin. And I'm sorry that this uh, camera doesn't show the picture as well. Um, but this is for uh, Blue Sneaker uh, Press and San Diego Zoo Global. And this is my second book with the San Diego Zoo. I'm currently working on a third one about sloths. This one is um, about pangolins. And as we know, they're really endangered and they actually kind of came to the forefront because of COVID because there were some um, sort of untrue information about them spreading COVID, you know, because they were in some of the wet markets in China and they are extremely endangered. Um, and so people have been trying to call attention to them um, and, and this book is a, is a good uh, book to kind of learn about them. It's about a mother pangolin and her uh, baby. And it's really cute uh, when pangolins go through the forest, their baby rides on their back and sort of they go out at night, they're nocturnal. And um, she runs into some 
what they perceive as dangers and they run into some friends and it's a really cute book um you know i i, I think i think it's a good way to learn about the animals excellent thank you and lindsay uh would you be willing to share about scooper and dumper everyone um so my book is scooper and dumper and it's about two vehicles who live in a small town and one day a huge snowstorm hits their town and they are clearing the way so that you know other cars can get through and the city basically shuts down the nearby city and so they kind of have to go in and, and save the big city as well um I have three boys, so everything is vehicles all the time, which if you look at my other books is probably a running theme. Um, so this one was really fun to do like a, a buddy duo book about um, a front loader and a dump truck and how they kind of take care of their small town and the big city as well, so. Thank you. Um, is, were, are any of your books, were there, are there any special behind the scenes stories that um, you might have about a page or an illustration in the book that one might not um, know about uh, by reading the story? Um, things that may be hidden, things that may be special to you that you'd be willing to share uh, or the, the a special story of just the creating of it possibly. Um, I always say that these are stories that we at the museum love to share with our visitors uh, about your work and um, would love to see if there's any uniqueness to the creation of the books that you've described. Are you asking me first or? I, I would open Oh, okay. <laughs> I would open it to, to any of you. Okay. I didn't know if we were going in an order. Um, I, I can say with my experience, everything comes from firsthand experience. So everything I've ever done either was inspired by life or something my kids did or something that happened to me. Um, you know, I think with Scooper and Dumper, I, I, I live in a small town of 600 people. Um, and so we have vehicles that are just like this, where it's a front loader with attachments that come in and out all the time. Um, and, and they, th these two vehicles tend to do a lot of different jobs in the town because, you know, it's a smaller town. You don't have vehicles for every single task that needs to be done. Um, and so I would say, I guess that's my behind the scenes is everything's always life related. Um, and I think every book, and I'm sure everyone else can say, like every book has some sort of curveball in it, no matter what, no matter what, whether it's art related or, um, you know, the story or what I, yeah, I don't know. So I'm sure everyone else has similar things, but that's, mine are always connected to what happens to me in real life. Thanks, Lindsay. I, I'll jump in there if you don't mind. Sure. Um, this first, the little story I'll share is not necessarily in the artwork, but Devin Skillion, who's the author, I read this in an interview that he gave, but, um, <clears throat> The idea for this story came when he read a story about a Hawaiian couple who were doing some estate planning and they included their tortoise who was 65 years old at the time because the, these tortoises outlive their owners in many cases. They live a long time. And so that's what gave him the idea for this 80-year-old uh, tortoise and the 80-year-old Ike, his friend. Um, but anyway, here's one of the the pages. I don't know if you can see this. It's a double page spread. And um, a lot of the picture books that I work on, a lot of picture books um, will kind of go back and forth between text and art. And this double page spread it has no text. And so what I thought I would do is allow you to kind of uh, read the artwork and you have the tortoise in one corner and then visually you can follow that a little path clear over here to his mother. And uh, so um, most of the pages are, are shared text and art, but whenever there's a spread without text, uh, I really try to allow the artwork to um, lead you to the next, you know, to continue on through the book. So that's one of the, um, and you can, you know, start with the little tortoise and end up with his mother. He's, he's going to his mother to seek advice 
why he, his um, Ike has disappeared, his uh, human uh, has disappeared and his mom is full of wisdom. And that's where he learns that, you know, you appreciate the people uh, that you have in your life because they're not always there. So spread with no text. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Christina, Terry, would you have anything um, kind of that you could share about the, the creating and maybe things that might be hidden in, in one way or another? I don't know about hidden, but, you know, it is interesting when you're working on a children's book, it is a journey. And sometimes, like a lot of times, especially if you're working on something with a real animal and, you know, people that are scientists looking at stuff and, you know, the zoo looking at stuff, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of research involved, um, especially like whatever plants you show. I always say as an illustrator, you end up being an expert on things that, you know, you don't expect. And I don't want to say, use the word expert is extreme, but you have to learn a lot about things that you wouldn't necessarily run into in your run of the mill life. Like what sure. plants do you see in a jungle in, 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 um, you know, Asia, you know, you want to make sure that all those rainforest plants are, um, you know, are accurately depicted. And so there's that. And then there was also a spread that, you know, sometimes when you're sketching, you know, it takes a while to get on, like there was one particular spread where we kept revising the sketch and it wasn't getting to where we wanted it to be. And so I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, when they're looking at it, this isn't what they're envisioning. So I said, what if we change the whole perspective of this illustration and show it? Because most of the book is kind of close ups on the pangolins. And I said, what if we show, we don't have any picture in the book that shows the whole forest. And so when I zoomed out and did a whole sort of panoramic view of the, of the um, rainforest, you know, it was sort of like, that's it. It was sort of a flashlight went off, you know, how they always show the light bulb that goes off and everybody approved it. And it turned out that that was what the book needed. So I think it made it turn out a lot better. And, and so that's always interesting peek into the process. Like sometimes when we're sitting and sketching in our rooms, we need somebody else to kind of give a little bit of perspective of what we're doing. And let me see if I can find a page in here. I know this isn't going to show up best, but uh, you know, so we did this sort of, we'll see if we can get it to show. It's kind of, you can kind of see, we ended up doing this forest view where you got to see all the rainforest. Um, and it was much more interesting than like, we had a lot of, like I said, a lot of close up views. Thank oh, you. I forgot to say the author of this book is Carrie Hasler. I apologize, Carrie, for not mentioning you when I <laughs> first introduced the book. Thank you, Christina. Terry, anything you would like to share um, about your work? Sure. Um, actually, I can, by the way, these illustrations <laughs> are absolutely beautiful. I hate to follow those, but <laughs> um, uh, I'll piggyback on, um, especially what Christina, you were just saying. Um, I, I think you're right. Sometimes uh, you need some extra perspective and it can really open your eyes and expand your mindset. Um, I did. I de definitely did that behind the scenes with with uh, becoming Brianna um, because I actually had to kind of create a bat mitzvah <laughs> from scratch, and that includes a ceremony. It includes actually coming up with a speech, um, which is uh, sort of it describes um, a portion of a Torah reading. So I had to come up. I had to figure out a Torah portion that would um, come around the time of this book, which would be, I think, in June. And then I had to come up with a speech. So basically, I had to have a bat mitzvah twice in my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm really proud of this one. But I have to say, I had a lot of help. Um, I, had, I met with um, one of the rabbis at my temple, and he gave me such great insight and just helped me kind of brainstorm surrounding this and and I gave him a shout out in the book because of that and then actually um and you can kind of see her reading her speech this is the graphic novel portion of my book it, it switches out between graphic novel and kind of illustrated text um but I, I also I need to find this other picture because um we have a few rabbis at our temple it's so big and I decided to make um 
the other rabbi look like uh, the other one at our temple. It's kind of hard to see him, but there he is. And there he is again. <laughs> so no one would know that really, unless I mentioned it, but that's my rabbi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, and this maybe should have been a question I asked first, but what, how did you get to where you are now as an author illustrator in the world of, of picture books? And um, maybe Lindsay, could we start with you? Sure. Um, so I, I've known that I wanted to do this since I was 15. So I worked, my first job in high school was in a bookstore um, in the Bay Area where I grew up. And um, I met these, I was really lucky to meet these author and illustrators when I was so young. And I, I realized, I knew I wanted to do something in art, but I didn't know exactly what that was. And I'm I'm too type A to be a fine artist, I think. And so I met these illustrators and I fell in love with it and went to illustration or studied illustration in school. Um, and then I graduated and worked in a bookstore in Boston after college and basically sent out postcards of my art for about three and a half years before I got my first illustration job, which was illustrating the cover of a middle grade novel for Random House Canada. It wasn't even a book I could get here. Um, and that kind of started things off. I didn't have an agent when I first started. That came later, I think, after the second book that I did. Um, and then, you know, it was kind of one of those things where when it rains, it pours. I, I was at that mo moment where I was ready to give up after three and a half years. And I was managing a children's bookstore, which actually was very beneficial because I knew the market like the back of my hand because I was hand selling books all the time. Um, and, that, and that has provided to be a very good um, background, even, you know, 11 years later, still doing this. Um, so that was kind of how I got started and, and just kept doing projects. I actually never planned to be a writer. I always thought I would illustrate for other people which is probably one of the most surprising things about my career for me, because if you look at my books, I've only illustrated for someone else twice. So in the 11 years I've done this, I found that if I waited around for somebody to hire me to build an illustrator, I would starve probably. <laughs> so I started writing my own books and I was lucky enough to have an agent who thought I was a writer before and knew I was a writer before I was. Um, and, and then, you know, fell in love with it and started writing my own projects. And now I'm at the point where I, I love, I love to write and illustrate my own stuff, but I also love getting into other people's heads and, and illustrating, um, other projects too. And I actually want to do more of that now and mix it in and kind of punctuate my other projects with that. But that's how I ended up where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Terry, how about, how about you? What, uh, what path brought you to where you are today? Um, it was a bit of a crooked path, but uh, <laughs> I think I came to where I am now in uh, strange steps. Uh, first, I was, well, I, I studied illustration in college, but I didn't really want to become an illustrator. I think by halfway through college, I knew I wanted to become a cartoonist. Um, and by that, I mean newspaper cartoonist. And I knew what the odds were. So I got myself um, an actual job <laughs> outside of college. Um, I came to work for American Greetings, which is based here in Cleveland, where I live. And um, worked there for a long time, worked there for about 22 years, um, partly in-house, partly on contract once I uh, started having kids. And, um, but once I got to American Greetings, I knew I still wanted to be a cartoonist. So I kept submitting um, cartoons on and off to different newspaper syndicates. It took about 10 years <laughs> on and off. And I finally, I finally um, landed uh, in a daily strip called the Pajama Diaries, um, which went international, which was amazing and had a great run with that for uh, a good 14 years. Um, I was ready ret to retire it at 15 years, but um, backtracking a little bit, um, a lot of cartoonist friends of mine started um, 
getting into the graphic novel business or illustrated novel. And I kind of, uh, I got in on that a, a bit early. I wanted to give it a shot. And um, especially since there weren't a lot of um, female authors at the time that I knew publishers were looking for. Um, and so my timing was great with that. <laughs> and um, that's when I wrote Invisible Emmy while I was um, working on my, you know, on the side while I was uh, still doing my cartoon. And eventually, and Emmy did amazing. And, um, and then I moved on to the second book and then I kept getting more books. And finally I had, I had to put uh, the comic strip um, because the books kind of took over in a great way. And I was, like I said, I was ready to quit anyway. I just quit a, about a year early, um, a little bit sooner than I planned. But I, I feel like the, the comic strip had a really great run. So, um, so yeah, and now I'm trying to do some other projects in the meantime too, book related. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. I feel like I've had many different um, acts <laughs> <laughs> in my life. Thank you, Terry. Tim, how about you? Um, well, as a boy, I, my grandparents lived down the street from us and they had a lot of animals at their house. I love illustrating animals. Uh, my grandpa had a squirrel monkey and they had an African gray parrot. They had chickens in the yard and ponies and dogs and cats and canaries and parakeets. And uh, I mean, there were always animals around. Um, so I love animals. I think that's maybe... Um, that followed through into my, my artwork. But in high school, I broke both my wrists playing football. So I've spent a lot of time in casts and um, had to step back from sports. And that allowed me to focus on the artwork, uh, which was uh, kind of led me in the direction to pursue that. I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design, studied illustration. After graduating, I started in advertising, uh, doing ads for Huffy Bicycles and Procter & Gamble, different uh, companies. And then <clears throat> I married my wife. We moved to Kansas City and I worked for Hallmark Cards for five years. Mm -hmm. And in, in Kansas City, I helped them start uh, Shoebox Greeting. Uh, Shoebox was a, a small group of artists and writers. And, and uh, so I helped, I was one of the, the people that helped um, start the Shoebox Greetings division. And we left there after five years because I had just started getting uh, uh, an opportunity to illustrate a, a children's book through a book packager, which is a third party that kind of tries to sell the story, the artwork, and the, as a package deal. And so that, that happened. I got my first two books, uh, three books in contract, and we decided that it was too much to go to Hallmark during the day and work on the books at night and weekends and so on. So we packed up and moved back to Ohio, and I've been, uh, the greeting cards kind of uh, the popularity of greeting cards kind of disappeared, you know, diminished and the, my book work increased. So I've been focused on uh, my children's books uh, for, uh, for a long time since the, um, you know, early 90s, late 80s. And I've done over 50 books, picture books. Um, so that's where I am today. Great. Thank you, Tim. Sure. Christina? Um, well, yeah, it's kind of a circuitous path for me as well. Um, I actually went to school to University of Cincinnati in industrial design. And so uh, for those that don't know what industrial design is, it's kind of like graphic design, but you're designing 3D stuff. So I actually co-opted Huffy Bikes uh, in their industrial design department. They like design what products look like in toys. Um, and, um, you know, my first love when I got out of college was comics and I really wanted to do comics, but I was too slow. And so I started out illustrating for role-playing games. So I did a lot of artwork for games. Like I did artwork for Star Wars. I did artwork for um, Lord of the Rings, which was really fun because it was before the movies came out um, in the 90s. And so none of the illustrations were influenced by what the movies looked like. Um, so I did a lot of officially licensed stuff. I did work for Wizards of the Coast. I did um, work for, um, you know, Dragon Magazine. And then in the end of the 90s, like, um, so there was kind of a, I want to say kind of a crash of a lot of game companies. So I worked at an agency for a couple of years and redid my portfolio. And I started doing animal paintings for a local giftware company in Cincinnati. And so I started having all these animal paintings in my portfolio and I got contacted by Scholastic to start doing a lot of their Scholastic news magazines. And then I started getting picture books and more and more. So I've 
until recently, I was still doing some industrial design, but now I have more and more illustration. And I too have probably illustrated close to 60 books. And, um, you know, I, my goal is one day to have some books that I've written, but I end up getting so, my schedule ends up getting so clogged that whenever I start writing, then I get kind of taken by a tidal wave of deadlines. And, you know, I'll look at my book dummy a year later and say, well, it'd be nice to send this out, but, you know, I have like all these deadlines. So it's sort of been a sort of tsunami like career where it's like every time I think I'm going to go in one direction, you know, I get swept away doing something else. Great. Well, thank you, Christine. And thank you all. I, I am very appreciative that you um, have chosen this field and um, the work that you create um, truly serves as a wonderful resource for all of us. Do any of you have uh, an interesting, um, in your writing and your illustrating, a quirk uh, or an, like a, a process or an unusual habit that you um, have in your daily work or your work in maybe starting a book or finishing a book or quirks that you might have that um, you might be willing to share. And I, I would open it to any of you. I have a couple. I mean, I don't know if they're quirks. I, I'm, I'm really habitual about how I work. Um, not only in the time, because I have three kids under the five and under, but um, so I work really early in the morning. I get up at like five and work for two hours before my kids get up and, and again later, but I like being the first person up. I like the quietness of the house when I get up. Um, I have to have complete silence when I write. I can't listen to music or anything like that. Um, but on the flip side, if I'm illustrating final art, then I like to listen to books on tape or audiobooks, not music, because it feels distracting, which I realize doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but, um, and I, I find too that um, what I like when I'm writing, I have to read it. I like it to be quiet because I have to read it aloud. I really care about how the read aloud portion of it sounds like, right? Because at the end of the day, that's how it's going to be. Um, presented to readers. And then as far as the art goes, I find, and I'm really curious if the other illustrators do this because when I'm drawing faces, I'm making the faces that I'm drawing and my face is exhausted after I've been drawing for that long. And I find that my like cheeks hurt and I don't even think I, I don't know that I'm even doing it. It's just like my face is mimicking what I'm drawing so if the kids are grinning a lot that I'm drawing or they're set, like it's just a strange tweak. I'm really curious if anyone else experiences that because I think that's yeah. weird, but okay. Well, that yeah. makes me feel a little better. At least Tim feels it. Okay. Yeah, yeah same. <laughs> when, when I did okay. the comic strip, it was like every second. And okay, other, good. <laughs> yeah, other cartoonists, we've had this conversation a lot. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's definitely a, a universal thing. <laughs> okay, good. That makes me feel less strange about it then. Uh, um, I'll jump in here. I, there are two things that come to mind here. I, I worked with acrylic and oil paint for almost all of my books until the last like five years or so. And then I shifted to digital art. And so I've been working digitally for, I don't know, three or four books. Um, and I find that when I'm working digitally, you know, you're working on layers, you build the illustrations and you can go back a step or go back two steps if you don't like what you've done. And so when I go back to the, what are, what are the traditional method, you know, like acrylic or oil, I find myself when I'm painting, I want to find that button that takes me back a step or two. And it's not quite that easy. So it's a, there's a real difference between working digitally and, um, you know, traditional paint and, and pencil and that sort of thing. But uh, you mentioned habits. One of the, um, I played guitar since I was a kid, but one of the memoir books uh, had a character in it, a parrot, Memoirs of a Parrot, had a character named Todd and he played a ukulele. And so I thought, you know, to get that ukulele just right in the drawing, I'm going to have to buy one for reference. And so I did. I bought a ukulele during that book. And I, I would say since that book, I've developed the habit of playing a ukulele uh, uh, when I take breaks from my artwork. 
I'll just pick up a ukulele and strum it a little bit. Um, so, I mean, that's not a, a real quirky thing, but it's when you said habit, I think that's probably you know, as close to a habit, I guess, break time. And coffee, I always start the day off with a cup of coffee. So, you know, I like to travel to do research. I mean, I, um, and, and like in, in 2010, I did a book about red bats and that was really fun because I visited some people that did red bat rescue and, um, you know, they had a house full of bats and the guy like would wear bats underneath his, he would actually have bats. He'd have a shirt over his like t-shirt and then he pulled it back, there'd be bats sitting there. And so I've learned so much from the people that I've met, you know, doing my work. Um, I've done, um, I'm finishing, well, I'm actually just starting a book um, for a Swiss yodeler and she's pretty well known in Switzerland. And I got to meet the publisher. This is my third book that I've done with them, but I was uh, visiting, um, I had some family both doing um, sabbaticals in France. And so I went to France a couple of years ago and I said, well, let's go over to Switzerland. Of course, not realizing that it put my mom and myself through several seven hour trade rides to get there because you look at Europe and you're like, oh, that's just down the street. Um, and, you know, I got to meet the publisher and that was really fun getting to work. Um, it, it's been really fun getting to work on a book, several books that aren't in English. So the editor sends me the translation and um, there's music and it looks like we're going to be working on some music videos for that. So I feel like, you know, it's always fun to kind of dig into the research and learn about other cultures and learn about other animals. Um, I sketch at the zoo every month. Um, I co-run the um, Cincinnati Urban Sketchers group. And so every month we have a session at the zoo, and which has been really helpful for the sloth book I'm working on because it's the same species of sloth that's in the San Diego book they have at the zoo. And actually one of the sloths is pregnant right now too. So, uh, but it's really fun to uh, go and sketch every month at the zoo. Thank you, Christina. Terry? Um, <laughs> my habits are tend to be very boring. <laughs> <laughs> just um Lindsay like you I think we had the, this discussion last time also very type a everything has to be like neat and clean on my desk if you can't see I'm not really a sloth <laughs> you just can't tell um I it's my mother I, I don't know <laughs> just shove the mess to the side but and I also have to make sure I have a full stomach that's very important um, the other, the only other thing I can really think of at the moment is um, because I'm getting pretty deep into my series, I'm actually, I just finished writing uh, the first draft for my, for the sixth book in the series. Um, so I'm a, a little ahead of myself here, but um, these stories tend to all run during the same year, um, just rotating different characters. And I have to remember every little detail about these time, about the timeline, about um, like certain things that you might see in the school hallway. There's actually a dead rat that I throw into every book. I don't know why, but, <laughs> but he, he or she makes an appearance all the time. Um, it's, so it's just like the little details. So I, uh, I had to start keeping like a little kind of, dictionary or encyclopedia of, of little details. It's really just like my chicken scratch on a notepad, but it really helps me. <laughs> so that's just one thing I always do before I start any book to make sure like I, I add fun little, you know, drawings or details to, um, to the illustrations that should really be repeated or different things that might um, be related to the timeline that's involved. So Plus, I've got a terrible memory, so it helps me no matter what. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, if I may encourage folks to ask questions uh, through the Q&A or the chat uh, button. Um, and I, I'm going to uh, ask some of those questions now so that we don't run out of time. Um, the, here's a question. It says, as a new unpublished writer, I would like to know the best way to get an illustrator. Is it best to pitch a book before you have a connection with an illustrator or to find an illustrator first? Depends. If you're self-publishing, I've never self-published, but I think that a lot of those companies, you are a little more free to find somebody to work with. If it's a traditional publisher, I think it's better to submit your story and have it accepted. Uh, the publisher, a lot of times, will select the illustrator. They 
uh, you can, the author, I think, can suggest somebody, but the ultimate decision is left with the publisher. So it can be a tricky thing to make make a connection with an illustrator before you sell your story. Um, they may not buy it as a as a team effort. You know what I'm saying? They might like your story and not really care for your pick of illustration. That's my experience. Anyone else? I would, with, I would agree with what Tim said about that. That's what I've experienced. And I watched my husband go through it. He's an, he, he's an author only. So it's interesting to see that side of it where, uh, you know, he's not doing the art there. And, and it basically what Tim just described, he, they acquired his manuscript and then sent him uh, sample art from the illustrator they were thinking about hiring to get his feedback. He didn't have the ultimate decision, but they, they definitely, I think, wanted to know if, you know, he liked it at least, of course, because it's his text. I don't think every publisher is like that. I think some include the author and some can keep them in the dark and, in the dark, and they're like, oh, this is who we're hiring. So I think it depends. But, you know, what Tim described is, is is very accurate. Uh, I think if you're self-publishing, it's on you to hire them. Otherwise, the publisher is going to take care of that for you. Plus, uh, illustration is an investment, and um, you know, to have an illustrator work on a project, if you're going to commission the illustrator to do it, that's going to be much more expensive. So that's much more going to be a self-publishing uh, kind of venture. Um, you know, I always tell people that are wanting to start illustrating for children's books, it's like running a marathon. It's not like something an illustrator can just do in an afternoon or whatever. You know, you're talking, you're asking them to do, you know, at a minimum, you know, 16 to 20 paintings. And that takes a lot of time. So you have to pay for that illustrator's time. Um, and, you know, occasionally people say, well, can I get a partner who's an illustrator? And I guess the short answer is no just because we have to eat, um, you know, and, and this is how we make our survival. So, um, and I think the market's changing. I think that there is a lot more of a robust, say self-publishing field out there. But that being said, um, if you are, if your intention is to get published by one of the big publishers, you don't need an illustrator at all. You just send your manuscript. I, I would also add too that no, no publisher is buying a finished product by any means. When you see these books we're all showing you, they're buying what's called a dummy or a, or a, a, just a manuscript or sketches. Like when I go on submission now, I'm sending, and this is because I've been doing this as long as I have, but I'm sending a manuscript I'm, or, and like maybe a sample piece of art with one editor that I've done a lot of books with. I'm just giving her a pitch. That's all I'm giving her. So it depends. Generally speaking, it's not like you're handing over a completed book because let me tell you, they're going to make you change things. They always make you change things. So there's no, high, you know, unless you're planning to self-publish and put it out yourself entirely where you have full control, spending the money on an illustrator to make full illustrations for you is a waste of money if you're planning to send it to a publisher because they are going to want to modify and help you make it better and all of that so keep that in mind you really want to know which direction you're going to go in great advice. i can't really add to it because I, I i've only had the experience of illustrating my own work but everything that you guys said i've, I've pretty much it's been echoed to me as well. I've, I've heard the same thing. And I'm glad, I'm glad you said that because I actually get asked all the time <laughs> about that. And I, I always have, I always have to say, you know, this is, it's really the, if you're looking to get uh, hooked up with a bigger publisher, they're the ones who handle that and, you know, kind of takes the burden off of you a bit. So. Excellent, wonderful advice. Here's a question. Uh, I'm writing a children's book about me deciding at age seven to be an artist and a teacher. Uh, what would you suggest for starting? Uh, would it be character development or a written draft of each scene or something else? This is an artist asking? Uh, I, I, would, I would take it as maybe an author. Author? Yeah, because she then goes on to say that I'm asking because I want to work with an illustrator and being prepared is in the front of my mind. 
Well, I think that would go back to the last question. If you're not planning to illustrate it yourself, then just worry about the manuscript and getting that in really good shape because that's ultimately what you would take out on submission, whether that's you doing it yourself or an agent's representing you and doing it. Um, and as far as the, I, I'm sure you guys, you know, how, would say like it's a matter of what comes to you, right? Like if the character comes to you first or the storyline, I mean, it sounds like you're pulling from life experience. So maybe start with the narrative of what happened and then find your way in, you know, for how to connect to your readers through your story. I think it's always important too to find and figure out and know what the heart of your story is before you start um, and then go from there. I know with my first book, um, because the character was based off of myself, um, I actually went in in kind of a peculiar way and I didn't, I didn't have a story or an outline in mind, but you know, granted this was, I didn't have a deadline either. Um, so I was able to kind of explore and play. And I, I think that can be important too. Sometimes I like to surprise myself. So I just like kind of, if you have the character in mind already and the voice in mind, um, especially if it's autobiographical, sometimes just like going at it, just trying, trying to write from that character's voice. You never know where it's going to take you and it, it might lead you somewhere really great. Um, that said, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> so, you know, try, doing a manuscript first could be the way to go, but it's just another option. Thank you. Um, here's a question uh, for Terry, and then a uh, second part for the rest of you. Terry, you mentioned in your newest book uh, that your newest book incorporates graphics, uh, example, the graphic novel. Do you and the rest of the panelists find that illustrations resonate more or are more memorable with today's readers than words? If so, why? Wow. <laughs> Loaded questions. <laughs> I got really deep. Um, <laughs> well, I, I can I can say that I I don't think one or the other. You know, it kind of depends on the reader. Um, some some uh, kids are you know uh, read above their level and maybe aren't into graphic novels or um, illustrated novels or anything like that. Um, some like like myself, for instance, going back in time, I would have loved these um, while growing up because I'm such a, you know, visually fixated person, always loved comics growing up. I read comics instead of <laughs> graphic novels or like uh, cartoon anthology, things like that. Um, so uh, it, it really depends, but I know for my, my own style, um, because I have kind of that cartoonist sensibility and, but I'm also a storyteller, I also love uh, I also love writing itself. Um, I find that uh, a lot of my illustrations just kind of uh, tie into whatever I'm writing. Like they, they almost act as a bridge sometimes. Like um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I just kind of picked a random page. But for the illustrated portions, uh, the illustrated like more textual portions of my novel, um, it's almost like they, they flow from this to this, to this, to this. It's, it's all like very interwoven. It's just some are images and some are words um, or some are like images with words, <laughs> but, but it all kind of um, gets tied together. And I feel like that's really how I work best. Um, it, it actually took me a while to get into the graphic novel portion. I always seem to have a harder time with that. It's getting a lot easier, but I, I seem to um, just work better in the illustrated novel portion. Um, but I, I mean, I love it all now and, and I, I like how it gets broken up like that. It keeps, it keeps me a little more challenged and keeps me from getting bored. And I might be getting off topic now. <laughs> I don't know. Would anyone else like to reflect on that question? Um, you know, I find when I, cause I, I do write some comics and I have a web comic and I always find that I think so visually that like even when I'm writing comics or whatever, I tend to sketch them first and then add the words later. Like I kind of do the storytelling first and then, um, so working as an illustrator, I think I think way more visually. Now, when I've worked with some writers, I'm always in awe of like how deeply they think about character and, and, and the machinations of that 
part of a story structure, whether in a graphic novel or even in a picture book. And, um, you know, I've had a couple authors that are really good at poetry, for example, and I'm always envious of just how knowledgeable they are about the writing portion, because with me, I think it is often all about the art. Like, I love the way things look at. I love looking at illustration. I love drawing. Like, whenever I start writing a manuscript, I'm like, I want to draw this, and I'll start sketching, <laughs> you know, and, and so it, it, the question might depend on who's reading. Thank you, Christina. Um, here's a question. Uh, Tim, what digital art program do you prefer? Um, I only use one, so that's the one I prefer. <laughs> it's Photoshop. And the reason I was hesitant to jump into digital art is because early on, the brushes that I were, were played around with, it just looked too, didn't look like what I would normally do. So I found some brushes that I can kind of get close to what I, it might look like if I were to do it with uh, acrylic or oil. So, but it's, it's just um, Photoshop. And, and the second part of this question is, okay. what medium do uh, the rest of you prefer or use most? In Photoshop too, <laughs> but more, you know, much simpler, more graphic style, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I use, do you have a, do you all have Cintiqs or who, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I use a Cintiq. Um, I love Kyle Webster's brushes for Photoshop. Um, they're wonderful. Um, you know, that, that, I think Photoshop really is the best paint program. There's a lot of other ones floating out, out there like Clip and there's Procreate and um, there's even a lot of smaller ones like Krita and like I could keep going down the list. I, you know, I have a lot of students that use different paint programs, but I really feel like Photoshop is the best of the digital programs. It's kind of like if you want to be a chef and instead of like a lot of these other programs, it's kind of equivalent to like using maybe cheap pots and pans rather than industrial strength like you'd work in a kitchen. And I think Photoshop is best for that. I probably angered everybody that uses all these other programs. And I'm not saying that they're bad, but I think Photoshop really for pre-production and pre-press is the best. And results. I mean, that if you get the results from something else, then I guess that if it works for you. Yeah, whatever works for you. A lot of people use Photoshop, yeah. So I don't use Photoshop. See, oh. exactly, yeah. <laughs> Some people love other. It, I agree with you guys. I, it's a it's a wonderful program. I happen to be more of an illustrator kind of gal when it comes to the in or to the um, Adobe suite. But um, I actually use Procreate on my iPad Pro if I'm working digitally, and I work in cut paper when I'm working traditionally. So it just depends. Um, I hate 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 mixing paint, so working digitally or cut paper is very very suitable for me. Um, but I, I like both. I, I can relate to what Tim was saying earlier. I caught myself double tapping, um, my, my original art the other day. <laughs> I was, it felt like it was my iPad and I was trying to delete something. Um, but, uh, it just depends on, on the project. For me, the last few books have been, um, entirely digital because the timelines for them are so fast that I, they wouldn't be possible to do them in cut paper. Um, but I, 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 don't, I also, I don't like to categorize, like that happens to be what I work in, but I try to let the book dictate what it needs. So like if something came along where I felt like, you know, another medium like pastel or paint or whatever would be the right fit, then I would consider exploring that first. I don't like to, to say no to anything just because, you know, that's not something I've done in the past. Um, but those are typically what I work in. Here's a question. Um, was wondering if you could recommend any book or guides about how to write children's books. I would say, I mean, reading other like current picture books is a great way to understand the current market. Um, of course, I'm forgetting the name of it but do I have it in here? Oh, can I grab something? Is that, is that okay to like, <laughs> this is a really good one. Oh yeah. Um, this is the like 
one I always recommend to people, but um, which is, I'll hold it up, writing with pictures. I don't even know, if, I'm sorry if this is displaying backwards, <laughs> um, but uh, that's a really good one that breaks it down like really simplistically, like how the whole format of a book is put together. But I would say read as much as you possibly can by people that the work you like that is current in the market too. That's, that's how I learned <laughs> pretty much. But I actually just wrote down the name of that. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great book as as an as an artist. I mean, uh, Yuri Sholovitz or who, who, that wrote the book um, illustrated a lot of things inside of that book. So you you see visually, um, he leads you through you know what things to to consider when writing and how to. For, uh, format your book and things to consider. So yeah, I've, that's a, that's a, that is a great book. I've read other books like from authors, uh, um, Writer's Digest and, and various other um, how to write books. And there, there's something to learn from all of those. But if I were to, to pick one that I could, would settle on, it would be that one right there. That, that Lindsay. Lindsay, could you hold that the book up again? I, folks I did, I, and I just typed it into the um, to the chat with the, the title and the and the author. So Thank you guys, if you check your chat, you can see that I typed it out. So you have the spelling and everything. Um, but yeah, it's a great book for if you guys are starting out or curious, like expanding on what Tim said. It really talks about how the whole thing is put together in a in a a visual way, but also, you know, how the story is a part of it as well. So, You know, one book I really love is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud as well. And even though that's for comics, um, I love how Scott breaks down, like, how we look at art, um, like iconography and, you know, how the more detailed artwork is, how people look at it, how people look at cartoon artwork. It's really useful, like to learn about the psychology by the way we look at art and comics. So I highly recommend that one as well. Good. Thank you. Here's a question. I'm an illustrator with a concept and a plot for a book, but it's not written. Would a book publisher pair good art and a concept with a writer? Good question. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I've seen on rare occasion, it's a concept by, and then there's a writer and there's an illustrator. I have no idea what that like marriage looks like, like how they get to that point, but I mean, I guess anything's possible. I would say if you have a really solid concept though, and you're an illustrator, like have you considered doing it wordless to see if you can pull it off? Because concept books generally have minimal writing usually. Like I'd be curious if that's an approach you could try. It would, you know, before bringing a writer in, if there was a way to, to explore that, maybe you have already, um, but that would be my two cents. I wonder if um, you could just try and flesh it out a bit with the writing. Um, maybe try it, try it both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a question. When each of you reads a book, do you prefer to physically hold the book in your hands or do you access books in a digital way? I can't do digital books at all. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I shouldn't say that. I can read adult novels that way. Like I have no problem, but if, it, if there's art in it, like it has to be, it has to be the tangible experience um, for me personally. I'm the same way. Um, I, I like, uh, I, I, I'm reading an adult novel on a Kindle right now. Um, but yeah, especially with, um, I read a lot of, uh, a lot of other middle grade graphic novels, um, either for reference, for pleasure or, or for blurbs. And um, there's just nothing quite like it. <laughs> I don't know when it, when it comes to anything with, with graphics or, or um, illustrations, but I, but I have had to read those on my Kindle as well. And um, it's a, 
to me, it's kind of a pain, <laughs> especially since I usually have to like kind of, you know, zoom in quite a bit. Um, but, uh, but I've done it. <laughs> Here's an like, actual book over the, I don't, I don't read digitally uh, the books. I don't look at picture books digitally. I mean, I don't think I ever have actually, but even uh, when I'm creating the book, the old fashioned way was to submit a book dummy. You would take paper and you'd cut it to size and you'd glue or your sketches inside and you'd send the dummy to the publisher and you'd get that feeling of turning page to page and the surprise of the next page. And, well, now that everything's digital, I'm sending in PDFs, which is my new book dummy. And there, I think there's, I miss creating the paper dummy. There's something about holding it and the page to page anticipation and the payoff. And it's, it's a different, different thing. And maybe it's because I'm more of an old school type guy, but um, there's a, definitely a difference between digital and, you know, the in your hand kind of a book. You know, it's interesting too, like, although I think picture books happens to be one of the one categories and I'm, I would double check my facts on this, where the percentage of how many are sold physically versus digitally is still vastly higher than digital copies. That being said, I can say, because one of the imprints I work with is Two Lions, which is owned by Amazon. And we at Two Lions, you don't do any other, like with other publishers, you can control trim sizes. Like generally, like if you want to do a 10 by 10 book or, you know, a, a eight and a half by 11, you can do that with Two Lions or, or Amazon because they have to worry about the Kindle ratio. It's always eight and a half by 11. So that digital component is factoring in more and more. And obviously kids are learning things on tablets more and more, um, which, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that, but it is something that is part of it now. You know, it can't be ignored entirely as much as I would love it to all be tangible books. Yeah. Um, it does factor in. Um, what file dimensions do you work with? Depends like, on what the specs for the project are. Yeah, right. Um, you mean like what are the size of the books or how big are the files? I'm curious because because if there if you guys your illustrator files are massive, right, guys? Like like yeah, hundreds but, and hundreds of layers, right? But they're usually 300 DPI and they're done to yeah. size a little bit of a bleed, but it's yeah. usually 300 DPI. So, I mean, you can get as big as you want with layers and layers, but I'm not sure what that means, but yeah, I, really, it's. I'm oh, sorry. And the, the response was yes. That I think that's what the person was looking for. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, really, really, your publisher should give you the specs of what they're looking at. They'll tell you the size and um, you know how to upload the art. I mean, really, you could work in any medium as long as you can get a digital file to your publisher, you can work in any program, you can work in any medium, you can spray paint it on a wall, as long as you can take photos of it and get it to the resolution and shape that the publisher wants it. Um, that's the most important thing. So there is no hard, fast answer to that. It's whatever you're told the specs are. That's, that's the one beauty of working nowadays, if you're working digitally, especially, it's, uh, it's so much easier and faster and you don't have to mail anything, you know, only electronically. Um, so it's, yeah, I echo that too. It's really up to the publisher, I think. So one last question. Um, we, I think we, we could converse for, for a, a longer time this afternoon, but a question was, do you see a demand or have you noticed a demand for animated illustrations? I haven't seen that. I don't, I mean, I know with app design for certain storybook programs where, you know, the, um, the story is being animated, it's your art, but it's being animated for some sort of app platform. They do that, but I, and maybe you guys have had a different experience. I haven't really seen that in traditional publishing. Everything is still pretty much two-dimensional uh, as far as the art itself goes. I mean, 
I think you see that more in book trailers than anything else for picture yeah. books. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. I've, um, I've got animated book trailers, but that's about the extent of it. But um, that sounds like a really cool concept, though. Do you do the book trailers or do, does somebody take your art and then animate it for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the publisher takes care of that, thank God. <laughs> you don't want to see what I come up with. <laughs> So I, I would love for you to give our audience kind of a, just your recommendations uh, for those uh, that are, are interested in pursuing a career that you have chosen. Um, maybe just a parting wish or thought from you to them uh, as, as, we, as we leave this afternoon. Tim, how about starting with you? Oh, okay. Um, I would say as far as an illustrator or an illustration is to draw, just draw, 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 whether it's digital or on paper and pencil, however you feel comfortable, the, the more practice, the more hours you get in, the, you know, the sooner you're going to achieve uh, your goals. As far as publishing and storytelling, um, I would say just work on telling stories with your artwork, sequential art, you know, it, from three page sequence to, you know, a lot of these books are 32 pages, but you got to start somewhere. So, um, you know, look into read books, talk to people and learn how to effectively tell a story with your artwork. So. Lindsay? Uh, what? Lindsay, would you have oh, a party sure. thought? Um, I would say that it's important to be your biggest advocate because no one is gonna do it for you. This is a very, it's a weird thing, right? Because it's a very competitive industry because the percentage of us that actually get to do this is very slim compared to how many people wanna do this. That being said, everybody in this industry is super supportive and wants to help you and wants to help you get there and figure it out because we all probably have PTSD from trying to do it ourselves that we want other people to you know, experience it a little bit easier maybe. But I think you have to fight for your book and you're, and you're gonna get so many no's. We all have had so many no's and you have to figure out a way to get that thick skin um, and move forward. I, I mean, I've been doing this 11 years and I still get, I've had horrid reviews still. I, I still, I had a rejection just there two days ago from a publisher. Like it still happens just because you, you know, so, but you just keep going. You have to believe in the work that you're doing and you have to keep going and, and keep learning. Don't ever think that you have it all figured out because you don't keep learning and reading and, and, you know, putting yourself out there with your work. Terry, how about you? Yeah, um, I think uh, both Tim and Lindsay had great advice. Um, and uh, just to add to that, I'd say um, if, if you're writing, well, in illustration too, just, um, you know, find your authentic voice, like try not to, um, try not to think about what you think others uh, might think of your work, just try, try and write from your heart. Um, and uh, illustration, yeah, I definitely say practice and um and with the whole business like just be persistent you have to be persistent um yeah the rejection can be terrible but um but the only way to do it is to keep at it so um yeah thank you and christina um you know i agree with everything that's been said here i think persistence is really important um you know and, and if you want to be an illustrator, whether for children's books or in general, I think that you really do need to get your work out there and put the do the type of work that you want to do. So if you want to do children's books, like Tim said, do some storytelling, do, you know, five or six spreads that are sequential. If you want to do comics, do five or six pages that are sequential, you know, whatever it is that you want to draw, make sure you have that in your portfolio, because that's your uh, calling card. That's what people look at to give you your work. Um, they are gonna give you an assignment to do something that they don't see in their portfolio. I mean, right now, a lot of people will do a Google search, even art directors. And if they see they love the way you draw tigers, they'll call you to do a book about tigers. 
um, you know, all illustrators have experienced something like this. So it's really important for you, if there's something that you want to do, draw it and become good at drawing that. Like Tim said, a lot of practice. Well, I, I thank you uh, to, to Tim, to Terry, Christina, and Lindsay uh, for this wonderful uh, program this afternoon. Um, a reminder that you can get copies of the books by each one of our, our authors and illustrators today from the Book Loft of German Village. And you can find that at the website, uh, bookloft.com. I'd like to thank again our festival sponsors and partners and thank you, all of you today for joining us. Please check out the Ohio Anna website for this year's festival programming. Uh, thank you again. Uh, all the best to everyone here this afternoon. Um, you will never find a, um, a kinder, more gentle, respectful group of people in a profession than you will in book, children's book authors and illustrators. Uh, you all and all the colleagues that you have uh, are wonderful people and uh, we are so blessed uh, to have you in this world in which we live. So thank you. Take care. <laughs>